Players champion for Jim Davis. What a bounce back from last year. Tough year last year for him at the Players Championship. And tournament didn't get off to the best start for him. He barely stuck into day number two, but has made the most of it. Uh, being on the draw in all of his matches thus far on day two, but really being rewarded for an unconventional choice. The only player in the room to show up with Eldrazi, and he has just been feasting on mid-range creature decks the entire afternoon. For Todd Anderson, one could argue the most dominant player in Open Series history. And looking to add just another notch on his resume here, being the player's champion in 2015. Also an opportunity for him to avenge the losses that Tom Ross and Brad Nelson took today at the hands of Jim Davis. A prayer to him to start our finals here in match number one. Davis's first draw is a hanger back walker. He'll play a forest. He's got a jotty off shoot. We head back Anderson's way. Kolagons command the draw. For turn two, it's a jace here for Todd. No one knows this deck better than he does. Yes, very fluid with the play. I, Todd is a fast player under most circumstances, but especially with Jeskai Black, given the complexity of the decisions, the lands, and so forth, Todd's pace of play is very impressive. And Jim with the Shrine into a hanger back walker. That'll come with a plus one, plus one counter. So he's on the board a little bit early here. We'll go back over to Anderson. He swamped the draw. Though, even though... Jim has played a, made a play here on turn one and turn two. I'm not sure this is the kind of draw he really wants in the matchup. Uh, when you're playing out these cards early on, it's hard to get the right mixture of lands and the large spells, which I think is Davis' best, best path to victory in the matchup. Also makes cards like Kolagon's Command attacking Davis's hand much more of a concern. Looks like Anderson's going to discard an island. You see he's got a copy of Fiery Impulse in hand, among other options. He'll play a Swamp. And perhaps we'll see a painful truths here. I know this is an unconventional play, and, and Anderson does attack with Soulfire Grandmaster, so there's an argument uh, for getting the option to play. I wonder if that card's just supposed to stay in the hand as padding against Kolagon's Command. Just something to discard? Just something to discard. There is Kolagon's Command. Going to go after Hangerback Walker and make Davis discard a card. And this is the worst-case scenario for the for the Jotty offshoot here. Hangerback Walker is going to die. Jim's going to lose a card out of his hand. Todd's threatening to flash back the Kolagon's Command somewhere down the line. That's another card out of the hand. And Jim getting to Ulamog being down two cards out of the hand is going to be a challenge. Well, Ulamog will be the discard. A Thopter will be left over. And now we're going to head back Davis's way. Davis will draw. Dragonlord of Tarka. There's a forest. He'll gain a life. You see the hand is pretty expensive right now. Here comes a Thopter. Jim's in very good shape if he can get to a land next turn. He can then cast Explosive Vegetation, and then he has an Oblivion Sower on top of that. Mm -hmm. Then he's got all the mana he needs to function. He's drawing very live off the top. But his hand is also very vulnerable to getting attacked by discard. So if Anderson can cobble together some more copies of Kolagon's command, Jim may not be able to get to the top end. Well, Todd Straw for this turn was a real doozy. It was a copy of Duress. Now the question, of course, is is he willing to fire off Duress in this situation? He's got some other options here in Painful Truths. Treasure Cruise, Fiery Impulse, stuff like that. Well, he's not necessarily giving up the play here, as the Smoldering Marsh can come into play untapped. That gives him four mana this turn and allows him a pretty easy play here of duress and a painful truth if he wants it. I think the, the big question is, does he do all this up front and then flip the Jace? Or the other way around? Well, he's got a painful truth now. That's where the turn will start. So three cards on the way. Polluted Delta is one. Painful truth is two. And it looks like a Shambling Vent was number three. Now, what's interesting here is that because he's drawn the vent, I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised if maybe he plays the vent here. We'll see what happens. He's first going to draw and discard. Mystic Monastery. He'll discard that. There's a Smoldering Marsh in Duress. Just curious to see if he would cast it or not. I think it's correct to cast it. And of course, I'm working with perfect information, so I know Jim's hand. But I think maybe something could have let him off the path of casting it. I think that Anderson's sequencing here was just because he wanted to get one more loot out of the Jace before it turning into a Planeswalker. So he does the Painful Truth. That's card number three. Then he loots with Jace. I think his plan the whole way was to end up duressing. But the Painful Truth might have revealed something else that he wanted to do instead. Here's an attack from one with the Thopter. Davis would have drawn the fourth land. There's the forest for the explosive vegetation that he no longer has in his hand. So all he can do is just pass the turn back. He's up to 23 from the offshoot trigger. Back over to Anderson. Five cards in the graveyard. So Jace will be flipping if Anderson does activate it. Anderson's hand 
loaded up, of course. This deck always seems like it has seven cards in its hand, thanks to Treasure Cruise, Painful Cruise, Soulfire Grandmaster, and Jace. Jace will go active here. Monastery Mentor, the draw. That's a big one. That's a clock that can close things out real quick. And, and I can't overstate the significance of this particular game one and the outcome of the entire match. Todd's matchup gets a lot better post-board, and I believe Standard is Jim's best shot of getting a match. If he loses this game one, that might mean he loses the match, and if he loses the match, he's got to do a lot of catch-up in some underdog formats. Fire Impulse is going to go after Jotty Offshoot. That'll bring a Monk along with it. Shambling Vents to land, and it feels like Anderson's already starting to pull away now because Davis is floundering. He needs to draw Explosive Vegetations, Nissa's Pilgrimage, anything but Ugin, which is what his draw step was for the turn. And, and Anderson's Graveyard is going to have no mercy here for Davis. He has the ability to flash back Kolagon's Command and Duress. Keep going after the hand while Jim is lacking the mana to make any big plays. Soulfire Grandmaster the draw here for Anderson. Again, he's got Treasure Cruise. He's got Painful Truths in hand. He might be thinking Kolagon's Command. He'll start with Painful Truths. He'll make another monk. Upside down, meaning it is summoning sick. Cannot attack. Polluted Delta, utter end. Monastery Mentor, numero dos. The thing about Mentor in this deck, too, because Todd's deck is so spell heavy, doesn't take long to close. No, and, and it's a big vulnerability of Jim's list. Compared to the old builds of Just Guy Black that Todd was playing before without Monastery Mentor, he had a lot of time in a matchup like this to be able to get his land drops and get something like Ugin, because the clock was Soulfire Grandmaster or Dragon Master Outcast with six lands in play. Monastery Mentor, if Jim's not doing anything, this card can kill Jim very quickly over the course of two or three turns. It's a sunken hollow there for Anderson. Here come the beatdowns. little prowess action as well. Don't forget about that. Painful Truths was cast before the attack. I think Jim might be considering a block here in this situation because r realistically he may not ever get a shot at another block. Yeah, Anderson has the ability next turn to just flash back the Kolagon's command and take care of the Thopter. Yeah. It's just so easy for Todd to kill a 1-1 flyer. There's another Monastery Mentor. Pass the turn back now. Davis will draw another copy of Jotty Offshoot. You can see this that card in this matchup is probably going to go after sideboard. It just doesn't do enough. It, it is good against specifically Soulfire Grandmaster. Yeah. That, I, we had a match earlier today, I believe it when Jim was playing against Tom Ross, where Jotty Offshoot saved him a lot of points of damage, but it is not much defense against Monastery Mentor. Planes the draw. I think Todd can cast an utter end and flash back Kolagon's command. Attack for lethal here. Yeah, it might, <laughs> might be enough. Well, that's I guess every spell is gonna just four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, I guess should, Jim's light toll is still fairly high, so it's it's probably next turn. Mm -hmm. Mentor is such a silly card if it's not killed. Todd just looking to see what the relevant cards are in the graveyard. He's gonna start by casting a treasure cruise. See how many spells he can cast this turn. I suppose with treasure cruise, he could still potentially get to a kill this yeah, turn. Yeah, absolutely. Another mentor, crackling doom. Crackling Doom plus Kolagon's Command is a pretty good suit of cards to have if you're trying to get to lethal. Yep. Every spell is essentially worth four points of damage. There is Crackling Doom. Down goes the Thopter. Crackling Doom. Down goes the Offshoot. Couple of monks made this turn. That's that's Xaxes. That's 18. Yep, that's that's 18. That'll do just fine. Todd Anderson going to win game number one here over Jim Davis. Jeskai Black very quickly up a game here over Green Red Eldrazi, which means Jim needs to go to the drawing board. He's got to win these two games. And, and like I said, Jim's back against the wall already in a big way. He's got to come up with two wins here. Not impossible, but the post-board games get a lot tougher for him. And like I said, if he loses this match... He's got a real uphill battle in front of him because Legacy and Modern are going to be a lot less kind to him than Standard will be. Well, 
We're going to go to the sideboards here for both players. We're going to start with Jim Davis. He's got a Den Protector, Desolation Twin, a Void Winner, two Hollowed Moonlights, three Rending Volleys, two Winds of Klaus Sisma, a Dragon Lord of Tarka, two Radiant Flames, and two Copies of Roast. So we have a pretty good sense of how Jim is approaching the matchup at this point. We watched him play a couple times. I think we're going to see the Rending Volleys, the Radiant Flames, and the additional copy of Den Protector come in here. Uh, some Sweepers, Radiant Flames being a particularly good answer to Monastery Mentor. Uh, Rending Volleys are, are clean one-for-ones early on in the game. And with the game likely to go on for longer, and Jim having to slog through duresses and negates the Den Protector's attractive option as well. On the other side of things, a Dispel, a Cola Guns Command, three negates, two Obnixilis reignited, a Duress, a Painful Truth, three Radiant Flames, two Roast, and a Ruinous Path. Ruinous Path, Duress, negates the Obnixilises. Uh, we, we've seen this before, the extra copy of Painful Truths, just settling in for a longer game, more card advantage, and with Duress and Negate, Todd it comes equipped with more answers for Ugin post board, which is one of the more problematic cards in the matchup. He is flooding the board with a lot of small permanents, and he doesn't have a ton of answers to Ugin game one other than preemptively getting out of the hand. With an additional copy of Duress and three copies of Negate, he has a lot more insurance there. Well, now we take a look at the players who did play in this tournament all weekend long, as now there are only two left, so of course. There were some others that did join us here at the Star City Game Center in Roanoke, Virginia. See where they've all slid in and what they'll be walking away with here. For 100 Ants, Rudy Brisker, Ross Miriam, and Ali Antrazi. A disappointing tournament for them. They do walk out of here with $500, but you know they were looking for more. Yeah, but uh, with a, you know, that's the structure of the tournament. Four people got to go day one, and unfortunately for these four, it was not their weekend. Jacob Wilson, Alex Bastecki, Joe Lissette, and Tom Ross, 9 through 12. They're walking out of here with $1,000 apiece. And for Caleb Scherer, Jonathan Morawski, Danny Jessup, and Logan Mize, you know, players who were probably not selected at the top of people people's list of who they thought were going to win. They really proved something this weekend. And a lot of validation for a variety of people on this list. Kevin Jones with the fourth place finish. I think there was a stigma coming in for a lot of the players who qualified primarily through IQ work, but Kevin Jones, John Morawski had very good performances. And of course, Brad Nelson, defending players champion, undefeated all the way throughout the tournament until the semifinals last round where he lost to Jim Davis. He finished in third place. He's walking out of here with $4,000, which means we've only got two players left. One getting 20000 the other getting eight. And right now for Jim Davis, is back up against the wall here. This is a match I think he really needs to win if he wants that 20000 If Jim elected to take the draw, or excuse me, elected to have standard as the format once Todd selected the play, that means he felt this was his format where he was most likely to win a match on the draw. And a lot of that comes from the edge that he has in game one. So that loss is, is huge for the way that this whole thing lays out. But there are two more games to be played. Yes. And he can win both of them. Again, he feels like the matchup is favorable. I feel like the matchup is in his favor. I, I don't think it's a landslide advantage, but I do think it is in his favor. Right now, I, I believe he's 2-1 and one in the post-board games in this matchup in this tournament. He, I believe he won game two against Tom Ross to seal that matchup and then split the post-board games in the previous round against Brad. Tom Ross's list was a little bit different than Todd and Brad's, and I think he was coming with a little less in the way of duress negate action for this kind of matchup, both in the main deck and in the sideboard. So I don't know if that's necessarily indicative. I think his matchup with Brad and Todd playing the same 75, a much better indicator of how the postboard games look. Yeah, these negates, these Coldagon commands that he does have access to, duresses as well. Todd's got some goodies on the board, and those ones do matter a lot, especially negate. That's a huge card right there. Jim Davis will be on the play here. Player from Long Island, New York, who, again, was looking to bounce back here at this Players' Championship. He qualified early, season one point champion, and now he's made the most of his return to the Players' Championship. Pretty happy for him, honestly. And he was very disappointed with the performance last year. Uh, Jim is a very, very competitive person, and he takes these large tournaments, the Invitationals, the Players' Championship, very seriously. Uh, I know that he was really disappointed with what happened here last year, getting bounced early. Um, almost, honestly, got bounced pretty early out of this event, too. It was yeah. not looking good, but uh, his deck selection for standard was perfect, given what the field has looked like, and he's knocked out some of the biggest names in the tournament along the way. You can see the 31-year-old from Long Island, New York, nine Open Series top eights, his first Open Series win earlier this year in Indianapolis, which helped him solidify his invite to the Players' Championship based off of that point invite. So that is Jim Davis for you with 200, 207 Open Series points this year. Though, unfortunately for him, it looks like a tough pairing here as his record against Todd Anderson lifetime, 0-5. Mm. Todd has gotten better of him all five times they have played. Charlotte Invitational, 2014 in Legacy. Somerset Invitational, 2013 in Legacy. The DC Open Legacy was the format there in 2014. Baltimore Modern Open in 2015. And then Somerset Invitational in 2015, the Legacy portion of that. 
That was our season three invitational earlier this year. So one could say that Todd has Jim's number. Be a good time to break that losing streak if you're Jim. Pretty high stakes match. <laughs> a little bit on the line. Some money and prestige on the <laughs> line here. <laughs> Just a little bit on the line. Remember, winner of this will get to defend the title next year as well. They'll qualify for the Players' Championship again. For Anderson, a thumbs up. I was talking to Todd during Jim's match with Brad. We were out in the lobby watching the match together. He said he felt that he can mulligan pretty aggressively in this matchup because of all the copies of Treasure Cruise and Painful Truth. So uh, don't be surprised to see Todd Mulligan pretty aggressively throughout the course of this matchup if we get to a third game because he feels with all the card drawing, he has some padding to look for good hands. Todd kept his six. Hang your back, Walker, the first draw here for Jim. Jim kept his seven. Some expensive cards over there for Davis. He's got a Dragon Loader Tarka and an Ugin in hand. Now the question, of course, is can he actually get to those cards? Looks like he'll go with Sanctum of Ugin and now Hanger Back Walker. So now we go over to Anderson. Anderson's going to sacrifice this land on Davis's end step. Figure out what land he wants to search for with the Bloodstained Mire. And he'll go with a copy of Sunken Hollow. Anderson will take a draw step here. Remember, he is on a mulligan to six. Picked up a swamp for the turn. Sacrifice this flooded strand. And now here's Chase again. Chase will make sure that he finds the right cards basically always. And Davis will draw. It's a forest. Timely. Don't think he had the third land, but he does now. And he's got a copy of Map the Waste. Is this our first record recorded bolster for? Happened last match. Okay. Yeah. I even put out a bolster alert. Right on top of it. And with the way that Jim's hand is lined up here, it looks like he might have mapped the way search for a land into explosive vegetation search for a land. And that's the kind of draw he's looking for. And a top end, Dragon Lord of Tarka. Yeah. So uh, looking like a pretty smooth curve here. Now, Duress kind of blew up this plan last time. There's a Plains. He'll grow up the Hanger Back Walker. Excuse me, he'll bolster an attack, mm -hmm. not activating. <laughs> and give him the business with that Hanger Back. Might as well. Searching for a Plains there kind of interesting. Well, he has... A variety of ways to find the mountain in the deck, mm -hmm. and I think that Jim wants to have the ability to Radiant Flames for three in the matchup okay. as an answer to Monastery Mentor plus a Prowess Trigger. So he's getting the planes now because it's harder for him to search for the planes. With Wooded Foothills, he can go get the mountain. Todd with two copies of Duress in hand. And Jim does have the Wooded Foothills in hand, so yeah, that makes that decision pretty easy. Here comes Duress. It was Nissa's Pilgrimage, not Explosive Vegetation. Still good all the same. Taking ramp spells away from this deck makes it very difficult for it to win. Ugin, Dragonlord, or Tarka in hand as well. Those would be the payoffs. And this is another hand that risks turning into a dead end here for Davis. If the ramp spell is selected, uh, he's waiting for a long time to find something to do. Well, there goes the Nissa's Pilgrimage. He'll have to top deck some ramp spells or some lands now. He cannot afford to draw his top end spells now. And, and Todd's got a brutal follow-up over the next following turns. He can play Soulfire Grandmaster this turn, untap, play Monastery Mentor, and Duress, taking the Ugin out of the hand, and leaving Jim with Dragon Lord Tarka and only five lands in play. An activation of Jace here. We'll see Anderson discard a copy of Flooded Strand. The follow-up is a Swamp. Here comes Soulfire Grandmaster, and it's a passing of the turn. Back over to Davis we're going to go. He'll draw a card for the turn. It's an important one. Looked like it was just a land that turn. Again for Davis with the selection of this green-red Eldrazi deck. Certainly not the best deck in the format. Pretty far from it. It's a matchup deck. Yes. 
trying to capitalize on what he would assume would be a room full of mid-range creature decks without specific Eldrazi hate like Infinite Obliteration, and he guessed right. I believe we only had one Atarka Red slash Red Green Landfall style player in the tournament. That was Jacob Wilson. He was bounced during the wild card round. And the rest of the field is a lot of stuff like what Todd's playing. Negate the draw here for Anderson. He'll activate Chase. Time to draw and discard Soulfire Grandmaster the draw. He'll discard one of those. Transformation complete. Here's the Telepath Unbound. It'll start on five. And now there's a Bloodstain Mire. Smoldering Marsh. The land of choice here for Anderson. And now there's Monastery Mentor. Here comes the dress you spoke of. Make a monk. And now there goes Ugin. The draw was Sanctum of Ugin. Now there's a little window here for Jim. Ramp spell pretty important right now, I think. Radiant Flames also pretty important. He does have some big draws. Yep. Here comes Soulfire Grandmaster. There's a block. Pump it up means that Hangerback Walker will not die. And now he'll sacrifice this Wooded Foothills and likely dig out the mountain. So Jim does have some big draws here. He also has a lot of misses. So there are some real stinkers available this turn. His draw for the turn, for example, had he not sacrificed that fetch line, would have been an Ugin. Not so much. Let's see what he draws now, however. Oblivion Sower. Well, that's a perfect. That is perfect. That's a threat card and potentially more lands. Yeah. It's huge, too. Just a big body. Biggest thing in play. Yeah. It's a big draw. Anderson has not removed any lands just yet. But for Davis, that's an absolutely huge draw. Now, does it bring lands along with it? We'll have to see. When you cast it, we'll find out. The answer is no! Two negates! A painful truth and a treasure cruise. Very important for that card to hit the land number seven, but at least it's something in place stabilizing the board a little bit, mm -hmm. hopefully giving Davis the breathing space he needs to draw land number seven for Dragonlord of Tarka. All Jim can do is pass the turn back. So to Anderson. Negate in hand, Mystic Monastery was the draw. Well, this is a bit of a danger zone here for Anderson, as he has, I believe, no source of card advantage in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. And no answer in his hand or graveyard to Dragonlord of Tarka. Jace will move up. Hanger back Walker will slow down. There's Mystic Monastery. Pass the turn back with just a duress. Another big draw step here for Davis. He stabilized things thanks to the Oblivion Sower. And Dragonlord of Tarka can clean it all up if he draws a land. Which he did not do, but a hanger back walker for three isn't a bad consolation prize. If he wants to, Jim can even start pressuring the Jace a little bit with Oblivion Sower. Mm -hmm. The board looks pretty clear for an attack. He'll have two hanger back walkers that are three threes on defense. So it'll be prohibitive for Anderson to crack back. And he can start wearing the Jace down a little bit or forcing some trump blocks. Other thing worth noting, of course, is that his hanger back walkers are pretty big. Don't really want to kill those. Todd can't really go wide very much just yet. And now we're getting to the territory almost where all of Jim's draws are good. We're not all the way there yet, but we're getting there. We're getting close to lands and spells are both good. Mm -hmm. And land number seven, that turns on the Shrine of Forsaken God, which makes a lot of the top end a lot more castable, particularly Ugin. Oblivion Sower will be blocked. Hanger back walker about to be cast. Three counters. Kick it back. Not going to trigger the Sanctum of Ugin just yet. Going to go Anderson's way. He'll draw a card. Looks like it was another land there in Shambling Vent to go along with the Negate in hand. There is the Vent. And for Anderson with his Jace... 
Going to take a look at the graveyard, see if there's anything doing over there. Could try to recast Dress, but he knows about the Dragon Lord of Tarka, so no sense in doing that. Yeah, a lot of anti-spell measures in Anderson's deck post-board. Not a whole lot of answers to Dragon Lord of Tarka. Todd's rarely building up the board to such an extent that Dragon Lord of Tarka is uh, that disastrous for him, but right now, that's what the game looks like. Radiant Flames to draw. Not much to be done with that here, it appears. Uh, Radiant Flames feels very castable to me. I don't know if Jim wants to pump the Hangerback Walkers first or just let them die and make a bunch of tokens. But it, it's a good answer to Todd's board, and there's a lot of dangerous draws of Monastery Mentor and Soulfire Grandmaster out there. I suppose because we can see Todd's hand. In this instance, if you're Jim, if you knew it was in Todd's hand, you might cast Radiant Flames just because you don't want Todd to be able to execute the negate loop mm -hmm. with Soulfire Grandmaster. And he's only got five mana available right now, so that makes it a little bit attractive if Jim knew exactly what was in Todd's hand. In the meantime, it looks like both of these creatures are going to go towards Jace. Soulfire Grandmaster is going to jump in front of Oblivion Sower. Todd will gain a little bit of life, and Jace will fall down a few counters. Down to five. Now Jim deciding, is it correct to cast Radiant Flames here? I think there's an incentive for him to cast it, because if, if Todd's really light on action right now, he may simply flash back a Duress next turn for a Prowess trigger through the Jace. So if you're going to lose the Radiant Flames anyway, I think it's worth casting. Fair enough. The gate will take care of that. It'll bring a Monk along with it. And now we're going to head back Anderson's way. Anderson's still in some real trouble here, though, because he knows Davis has a Dragon Lord of Tarka that he's one land away from him. To Todd we go. Chase the draw. Up to six goes the Telepath Unbound. Here's Vrin's Prodigy. And the coast is clear for Dragon Lord Tarka to get every creature in play next turn if Jim draws lane number seven. Well, what will it be? It's Ulamog. That's not lane Almost. number seven. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Anderson's still in a ton of trouble here. Yep. But uh, he's, he's stayed off the worst of it there if Jim draws lane number seven. I think we'd be going to game three shortly. The thing is, Jim's at 19. Oh, Jim's still in a commanding position. Mm -hmm. Don't want to understate that, but... Land number seven here as the Wrath, the Jace dying, and Jim with, you know, whatever it is, 12 points of power in play <laughs> versus nothing. Probably a pretty big favorite to take this one. Quite a bit of power in play, yes. And Jim going to figure out how he wants to go about attacking now. I think he might be saying attack you. No reason to go after Jace because the other one can just flip now. Mm -hmm. So he says, you know what? Let's start working on your life total. What do you think about that? Monk token in front of Oblivion Sower. Four damage will come across. Jim's got a lot of pressure in play. Obviously, he's got a lot of huge creatures. And Anderson is... One of his big draws in this spot to get back into the game is Painful Truths. Mm -hmm. So there's an incentive here for Jim to tax... Anderson's life total if he can. And attacking the Jace doesn't do a whole lot right now because Todd could simply flip the other one. Looks like Crackling Doom may be in the draw step here. Clean answer to Oblivion Sower. The question here for Todd is how do I want to use this Jace that's active now? Do I even want to use it? Do I wait? I mean, ideally with a Jace in six, at six, what you would want to do is... Flashback spell, flashback spell, activate Vryn's Prodigy, reset and go. I just don't know if there's enough in his graveyard where he can realistically minus the Jace over the next two turns. Here's Crackling Doom. That'll bring a Monk along with it. Down goes the Sower. Anderson has to do this on the main phase because otherwise Jim can untap and put a fifth counter on the Hangerback Walker at four. Uh, the risk that I have with this is I think Anderson... Kind of needs to keep a card in his hand to at least bluff something, because once the shields are down and he's empty-handed, if Jim draws land number seven, he has full information on how he wants to use Dragon Lord Tarka. He doesn't have to bother playing around a spell in hand. And if he can just clear out everything, 
I, I don't think Todd will have enough left over to rebuild with. Well, let's see what this draw step is. Branding volley. Seems fine in the interim. There are better draws, of course. Land number seven's better, but I, I don't mind having an answer to Monastery Mentor. With Todd empty-handed, it's hard for him to really keep up on the board unless he puts together some draw steps into the card drawing spells, triggers the Monastery Mentor a bunch of times, gets some Trump Blockers into play, and tries to find some workarounds to the board. Still not as good as land number seven. Of course But a not. running volley is not bad here. Looks like one hanger back walker coming into the red zone. Maybe two. Because again, I like Jim's plan of pressuring the life total. I think that's smart. You mentioned painful truths, and I think that's a good thing to kind of slow slow him down on. You, do, you don't know exactly what the breaking point on the math is going to be, but if you can get in some shots for free, you might as well take them. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't stop Anderson from casting it the first time, but maybe it messes it up the second time he wants to try to cast it. And there's the volley. Monastery Mentor down. Back over to Anderson will go. He'll untap those three lands, take a draw step. Ruinous Path. Want, want. Yep. <laughs> it's not a card this turn. It, it, I mean, it's, it becomes a card once Dragonlord or Tarka hits the battlefield, but the damage might have been done at that point. Mm -hmm. Not too excited about that one. And even now for the Speedy Anderson, things have gotten tough. Yep. Well, he knows that he's facing down Dragon Lord or Tarka the next turn. So he has to come up with a way to manage the board where he's already fallen behind. And also give himself some hope of being Dragon Lord or Tarka on the way back. And he has to do all this empty-handed uh, with not a whole lot in play. Not much going on in the graveyard here for Todd. When you see that active Jace, you might be thinking, I want to use that thing. But now Todd wants to see what's going on. So duress. The whiff. Some big O's. Ulamaga and Natarka. That's the grip. Back over to Jim. Hanging back walker into a 5-5. How'd we do? Almost! <laughs> the whiff. It's an Ugin. Isn't this deck a delight? I'm just so sick and tired of being land screwed! <laughs> <laughs> sir, sir, you have six you lands. You have six lands in place, and sir. You have, and you have three colors. And several colorless yes, lands. I'm, 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 <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It's such a stupid game! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And there's the block. Damage will come through. I think Todd trying to make it attractive to attack Jace by bringing down the four counters. But Jim's not biting. Nope. Uh, he, he, there's no real reason to go after the Jace aggressively with another Jace ready to flip. And there's an incentive for him to go after the Light Total because of Painful Truths. Well, he just drew Painful Truths. Time to gas up. Down to four. And th this game looks a lot different with Todd on four than Todd on 14. Yep. Two lands and another painful truths. Like I said, you maybe you can't stop the first one, but you can work the game in a spot where you stop the second one. Yeah, imagine if he's on fourteen down to eleven, down to eight. Right, cast Very another painful different. truths. Yeah, so, it's not intuitive for Jim's deck to be attacking the light total because he's sort of trying to arbitrarily win the game, turns down the road. But uh, I like the way that he's managed this game because Todd's life total is now a, a big concern and shuts out some of his card drawing. Mountain is a land. Jace going up. Slow down the smaller hanger back walker. If he's slowing down the s smaller hanger back walker, I, I imagine this means that he's planning on chump blocking the larger one this turn and flipping the new Jace over. And Davis will untap. That makes sense since the 5-5 five five is lethal. Den protector the draw. So stupid. I don't mind, a, <laughs> I don't mind another creature. That's well, okay. There's a wood of foothills in the graveyard, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the prize. Like Final. A, Finally. Well, you know, there's a map the waste if you're feeling a little bolster frisky. Get that going. Uh, that's uh, that's two turns. <laughs> I think Jim can do a little bit better than that. See how Jim wants to use this den protector that he's drawn. Rending volley also an option. And suppose if he feels like he's got the kill, he can just den protector back, rending volley, and go for it. Yeah. And he's still drawing to land number seven with a lot of time to find it. So maybe he can just go for the kill here. There's Morph. Todd knows what that is. Dead giveaway. And he might just be clear for takeoff, yeah. Tack yeah, well, one of the one of the hangback walkers is two power because of Jace. Oh, I suppose Todd still has the shambling vent. Yeah, there. and, that, so and that's hiding back there. He can't go exactly for running volley just yet. He needs to go and get it the shambling vent off the table. Yep. Jace will go active, draw discard, picked up a copy of Jace. Painful truth is going to be discarded. No time for that. So this Jace will transform. That one will stay around. Would have been on five anyway, so it doesn't matter. Now Anderson's going to fall down to two, and I'm not sure he's gotten out here. Three lethal creatures and, and Jim's hand gets turned on with the seventh land. You can't, call, you can't kill Hangerback Walker. Because of all the tokens it'll spit out, at least on the main phase. That'll do it. Jim Davis is going to win game number two here over Todd Anderson. Green, red, Eldrazi, Just Guy Black getting ready here for game number three. Jim Cyborg doing a little bit of work that game, too. Yeah. We, we focused a lot on Anderson, but the running volley and radiant flames were definitely big players there. Uh, with, with Davis able to get some of the critical creatures off of the battlefield, there's a lot more time for him to leverage cards like Hangerback Walker. He didn't even have to get to his top end that game. Just Hangerback Walker and some spot removal spells essentially was what did in Anderson that one. You see the options here for both players. They get ready here for game number three. We'll go over them one more time. Does Todd Anderson be on the play? Dispel, Kolagon's command. Three negate, two obnixless reignited. A duress, a painful truce, three radiant flames, two roast, and that ruinous path. Ruinous path, painful truce, duress, two copies of obnixless, three copies of negate, and perhaps the extra copy of Kolagon's command. Those are the cards I expect Anderson to have in. For Jim, a dent protector, a desolation twin, a void winnower, two hollowed moonlight, three rending volley. We saw those. Two winds of Kyle Sisma. A Dragon Lord of Tarka, two Radiant Flames, and two copies of Roast. My guess here, two, co two copies of Radiant Flames, the additional Dragon Lord of Tarka, three copies of Rending Volley, and the Den Protector. And those are the sideboard options there for both players. Game number three about to be underway. Remember, the winner of this match, sitting pretty up, one match of three. The loser gets to decide if they want to play first or what format they will select. Well, I think you have to select the play. Because sele if you select format, your opponent gets the play. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to a third match, they're just on the play. Oh, sure, so they sure. Get the play I apologize. For... They select the format. I apologize. Well, it's a little, it's worth going through, right? Yeah. Because, again, we're all dealing with this for the first time. I was running through these scenarios in my head as well. Uh, but I think you end up basically yielding the play twice sure. for no real benefit unless you value your time and you feel like you're a huge, huge favorite in one of the formats. And one thing we know about you. Well, I value my time. You I value know, your time. I know Todd does, too. Yeah. That's one thing that we do know. <laughs> we'll get together at the Nelson residence tonight. You know, yeah, we, got, so, yep. we got places to go. Yeah. But I think that you'll just take the play. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's my guess. Well, as these players do shuffle up here for game number three, we'll talk about SCG game night one last time this week, a month of December, and it's scary to say this, almost over. It's December 20th. Christmas is right around the corner. Still some time to get the reindeer here, though. StarCityGames.com slash game night for more information. Every month we produce new kits with pins and tokens. We mail these to the stores that sign up for game night, and the stores can run game night any way, any way they want, any format, sanctioned or unsanctioned. Just get players in the store on a regular basis for some fun and friendly magic. This is a December kit. We're running out of time for that, but we got January, Grizzly brand, and February announced magus of the moo get it probably, <laughs> probably do probably do yeah so that one's pretty self-explanatory so starcitygames.com slash game night for more information if you want to get signed up contact your starcity games in-store play representative and canadian store owners we have changed the shipping rates on these kits we are now just charging u.s domestic shipping so if you've not brought game night to your store because of the shipping costs on the kits contact your starcity games in-store play representative again number three about to be underway here todd anderson a player we'll learn a little bit more about right now, the 29-year-old currently living in Roanoke, Virginia, born and raised in Alabama, a big fan of the Crimson Tide, qualified 
via at-large point leader. 26. 26 Open Series top eights. That's a, a huge number of those. He might have more than everyone combined here this weekend. I have to check. Six Open Series wins, three Invitational top eights, with one Invitational W a few years ago in Atlanta. 263 Open Series points here this year. And the numbers here, the most impressive, 69.3 percent win percentage for 2015 on the Open Series, 23-16 and 16 versus the field, and 5-0 and lifetime against Jim Davis. Yeah, if you go up and down Todd's head-to-head -head results in this field, with the exception of Rudy Briska, his numbers are, are pretty dominant. Yeah. It is truly impressive stuff. Both players are going to keep seven. Mystic Monastery here for Anderson. That's where he'll start. For Jim, a mountain. A rep in a rending volley. For Anderson, a shambling vent. Going to pass the turn back. Let's go Jim's way. Explosive vegetation, the draw. There's hanger back, Walker. Here comes Bloodstain Meyer. Is it Monastery Mentor? Ah, different land, he says. Which one does he want to get instead? The mountain, perhaps? Imagine he's got a lot of threes in his hand, so. Yeah. Let's see what the spell's going to be. There's a mentor. Putting Jim to the test right away. Mm -hmm. Very good for Jim here if he has one of his sideboarded running volleys, but with Anderson having painful truths in his hand, I think Todd is looking to cast the stuff in his hand. The upside's huge here if Jim can't kill it. Todd might run away with the game very easily. And even if you can kill it, Todd's just trading one for one and getting closer to Painful Truths, gassing him back up. I see Todd's hand here. Three lands, Treacher Cruise, Painful Truths. For Davis, I hang your back, Walker on one. The forest and the mountain on the battlefield. Yeah, it looks like he does have some ramp in his hand, and this is Pilgrimage and Explosive Vegetation. And this is a big test for Jim. I mean, if he is on all ramp spells, his hand's a little bit on the slower side, and he can't do anything about Monastery Mentor... Uh, there's a window here for Todd to run away with this game pretty easily. We saw what happened with this card uncontested in game one. was able to go from zero to lethal in about three turns. Davis going to weigh his option. Now we'll see Nessa's pilgrimage. So one force on the battlefield, another force will go to the grip. And that'll be Davis's turn as he is ramping pretty well thus far. Anderson Straw for the turn was a copy of Smoldering Marsh, I believe. But he'll play a Painful Truce right away, make a Monk token. Three life lost, but three cards coming. Flooded Strand, Flooded Strand, Jace, Vrin's Prodigy. Here comes the Mentor. And now Davis's plan might be, you know what, I'm just going to ramp right by you. I'm going to do some broken stuff, see if you can beat it. There's a smoldering marsh for Anderson. He'll just have to pass the turn back. We'll head back Jim Davis's way. Four lands on the battlefield, at least a forest in hand. Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, the draw. The real question here is, does Jim have any of his payoff cards? I see a lot of band acceleration, but I don't know if he's got any of his top end. He'll start with the shrine. And now he'll explode. So two lands on the way. Might see him search at the plains in addition to a forest. Yeah, his deck is not that color mana sensitive, and having the option to radiant flames for three, uh, just a good thing to be doing, especially with Monastery Mentor already on the battlefield. There's the plains and a forest. And with seven lands on the battlefield, that means a shrine will tap for two. Now it's just going to be a question of, does he have any of the top end? I don't think Anderson has any defense in hand. I don't think so either. No duress, no negate. I don't even know if he has a removal spell for something like Dragonlord or Tarka. But I also don't know if Jim even has one of his payoff cards. Well, I suppose we'll find out when we head back his way. Bloodstained Mire here for Anderson. He'll sacrifice that. Go get himself a sunken hollow. Colors not appear to be an issue here for Todd. Does need one more basic to make sure that these battle lands enter the battlefield untapped. But Todd's hand is very land-dense. 
Time to draw a card. Soulfire Grandmaster is not what the doctor ordered. Not right now, at least. Yeah, he needs interaction for Jim's top end, and that's another thing that gets swallowed up by it. Yeah, he could go for a cruise. Well, then uh, the shields are down. Uh, at that point, Jim doesn't even have to respect the possibility of a negate. Todd, with only three cards in the graveyard, even if he cracks a fetch land, he still has to pay concentrate mana to cast his treasure cruise. With only one mana up, the coast is clear for Davis to do his worst. And it doesn't look like Todd's hand is in a position to beat Ugin, and Jim will definitely have the mana next turn to cast it. But Todd's hand is also so bad that I'm not really sure he can just afford to say go. And there's an island. And now here comes Treasure Crew, so he's going to refill again. Just wants to know what three cards are gone. Does Davis. Negate among those cards. He's got a hope to untap here. Here comes Mentor. Three power creature here in this situation. So safe to attack through the hangar back walker. Hey, Rack Walker going to grow. Anderson likely has a discard here. The shields are down. Yes, they are. And any of Jim's big plays here are going to be excellent. Todd doesn't even have a lot left in his hand, even if he does get to untap. He does yep. have a negate, but the rest of his hands just lands in a couple creatures. Ugin, Dragonlord Tarka. There's a lot of busted stuff. Radiant Flames? Also counts. Sure. Not quite as good as one of the big plays, but there's nothing wrong with that. Especially with Den Protector in hand and, and most of Todd's following up, follow up just being more creatures. Haven of the Spirit Dragon in hand right now for Jim as well. We might have Radiant Flames plus Oblivion Sower. That might be the line of play here for Jim this turn. Keep in mind, Davis has not played a land yet. And I think there are some lands in Anderson's Exile mm -hmm. that Jim would be getting on the house. Though there are no lands to find with the Bloodstained Mire at this point. Yeah, Jim has the one mountain. Also, Flooded Strand also doesn't do anything. The thing to keep in mind here with Oblivion Sower, you exile the top four cards of your opponent's library, then you can put any number of land cards that player owns from Exile into the battlefield under your control, not just the ones that you've turned over with the Sower. Radiant Flames here for three. Going to give him Jim three tokens. He's not going to go towards a sword just yet. You're going to see him play Den Protector face down. And now pass the turn back. And what he's just done here is he's just built a board. And, and yeah, it's possible that Jim's going to kind of go on this weird beatdown plan. I mean, next turn he can go ahead and get back the Hangerback Walker, load that up for a ton. He's got a bunch of Thopters in play. And Anderson's life toll is getting taxed. And the way that Anderson is sideboarded, you know cards like Fire Impulse, Roast, stuff like that, those are gone. He doesn't have a lot of cr creature removal after sideboard. And he's loaded up on Painful Truths. He even has Obnixilus for good measure. I don't think this is necessarily Jim's primary game plan, but uh, he has been well served dialing up the pressure a little bit here on Anderson in the post-board games. So far, Grandmaster Jace negated the ready. Does Davis want to un Megamorph? Maybe yes, maybe no. Well, Todd making a very strong representation of Negate because he is playing his two threats into the face of a Radiant Flames in the graveyard and a Den Protector face down. The flip side is that that would also clear out Jim's board. Mm hmm. So Jim can't be 100% sure that there's negate because Todd just might be trying to induce that play anyway. My expectation is that Jim will get back the hangar back walker to kind of follow up on the line he's taken thus far, especially since the Radiant Flames is not even clear that it's better for Jim at this point than it is for Todd. Well, there's your own Megamorph. Den Protector will get a counter. And now Jim's got to decide what to rebuy. And 
I mean, this is the call, right? It's between these it's two cards. It's so tough. My instinct here in Jim's spot would be to take hanger back, Walker. Follow up on the pressure you're adding and play around a potential negate. He's going to go with hanger back, Walker. He'll untap. Tough decision there for Davis. Yeah, that is not an easy one. Time to draw. Dragon Lord Tarka. Whammy. No disdainful strokes from Todd. 75. You're clear for takeoff, Jim. That is an improvement over Hangerback Walker for this turn. Dragon Lord of Tarker also represents pressure because it is an 8 8. Yes. <laughs> also it's true. a lot of numbers. It is. A lot of numbers. He's even got the Haven for good measure. Yeah, just in case it dies. And there she is. Dragon Lord of Tarka. Can't negate that one. Creatures down. And Todd now getting back to the same position we saw in game number two, where that that it's not clear the painful truth is really going to be castable for the rest of this game. Yeah, you know, something his deck does so well in traditional matchups like Obs on Aggro is just kill stuff. Well, the other issue here is what another thing his deck is very good at is gaining life in a lot of these matchups because you have Soulfire Grandmaster alongside the red removal. Todd's probably cut almost all the red removal out of the deck here because Roast and Fiery Impulse, they don't really line up with the threats that Jim's bringing to the table. What that means, though, is that when Davis is able to apply some pressure, the, the painful truths in Anderson's hand, the cost on those go up way more than it does in the matchups where Soulfire Grandmaster plus Roast is available because he just doesn't have the same routes to recoup the life loss. Yeah, what's, what's kind of interesting is that f in most situations, painful truths is just a free roll. Yes. It, it, it does never, I mean, it deals three, but you gain it back so easily. It's basically just three mana draw three. I, there are no costs. But in this particular matchup, and with the stance that Jim has taken with these hanger back walkers and den protectors and these creatures, Todd's life total is a little bit more at risk than normal, which means what Painful Truths is doing is hurting a little bit more. Now, here's a treasure cruise. Three cards on the way here for Anderson, and, of course, one of them is Painful Truths. In most circumstances, such a great card. In this one, not so much. You know, you have some matchups where you're playing this, even though there is a cost, your opponent's pressuring you with Siege Rhinos, but you expect to get the life back. Then there's some matchups where you expect your life total is not going to be really under duress in any meaningful way. This is a ladder match. This is a matchup in the ladder camp. Todd's not expecting the boards to look like this, but Jim has done a good job of just getting in his shots when he can. And the painful truths now have been stranded. Utter end. We'll take care of the Dragon Lord of Tarka. We head back Jim's way. Sanctum of Ugin. Here come the beatdowns. Maybe the quickest action Jim has taken all tournament there, that attack for six. He can feel like he's going to get this one. A bunch of mana here for Hangerback Walker. And that'll trigger the Sanctum. This will allow him to search. There's Ulamog. And you can see Jim prioritizing getting the old Drazi, the creatures, because he knows about negate in the sideboard and duress in the sideboard. <laughs> He's found himself a colorless creature card. Back over to Todd. Monast Mystic Monastery, a couple <laughs> copies of Painful Truths. Todd looking to go to negative four here. <laughs> Jim Davis is going to win this match here over Todd Anderson. Two games to one. Green Rattle Drowsy will take care of Jeskai Black. That's our last standard match for the weekend. Jim Davis up one match to zero here over Todd Anderson. So the win is a big thing. Also, because we discussed before, you can't really choose a format here because you give your opponent the play twice in the hypothetical. Jim now gets to decide which format does he potentially want the, the play for if they go to a third set. Mm -hmm. So for Todd, he'll get to choose. Player's going to take a break here as we come on back to the booth. Going to get ready for their next match with these two players. Of course, a little bit exhausted. We've been here since 10. These players have been waiting to play.